I'd like to start with a <clears throat> little thought. As I was writing this presentation, I saw this tweet from Greg Neagle quoting a uh, Dutch software developer. I'm not really a software developer. I call myself a software developer because I develop software. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a software engineer. I'm really not. Uh, I just call myself a software engineer because what I do is engineer software. <clears throat> and so, what exactly are we talking about? What's an administrator and what's an engineer? Well, an administrator is somebody that runs things, somebody who organises, as the dictionary says, works as a manager in a business, government, agency or school. They manage things. What's an engineer? Well, by comparison, an engineer is somebody who designs and builds. Engineering, according to the dictionary, is the application of scientific and mathematical principles to practical ends, such as the design, manufacture, <coughs> and operation of efficient and economical structures, machines, processes, and systems. And, uh, well, that certainly sounds more like fun to me than being an administrator. <coughs> so, uh, um, a systems administrator is somebody who runs and manages systems. Uh, and, and, and a systems engineer is somebody who designs and builds systems. Uh, hopefully, I do it using scientific methods. <coughs> um, some rules of engineering. Uh, who's old enough to get the visual joke? A couple of people in the audience. Okay, very, very good. Glad to see that I'm not the only <coughs> person who's, uh, whose computing started with bits of wood. Um, and over the years that I've been software engineering, I've learned a few rules. Um, and so today I'd like to uh, demonstrate and show you some of those rules and how I applied them to a particular project recently. The first is good engineers borrow. A good engineer wants to start from a known place, a solid foundation. Um, and let's have an example from real solid engineering, one familiar to all of us. Who recognises this? That's the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, I'm particularly proud of the Sydney Harbour Bridge because my grandfather spent four years as a foreman rigger on the bridge um, and uh, was incredibly well paid and that was the start of the Williams family fortune. <coughs> um, it was the biggest engineering task undertaken in Australia thus far. And you'd think, that it was an innovation and a marvel. Well, who recognises this? Certainly looks like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but in fact, it's the bridge over the Tyne River in Newcastle, England, that was done by the same engineering and architecture team <coughs> as the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and they in fact finished it six months before they started on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Now, this was a marvel and an innovation and a... Oh, hang on. Who recognises this? <laughs> now, there you are. This is actually the Hellgate Bridge in New York City. It's 60% the size of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. But it's certainly a solid foundation on which to build. And it was completed 15 years earlier than the Sydney Harbour Bridge in 1917. So, by the time they got to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they'd been doing a lot of borrowing. Quite a lot of plans had been dusted off, <coughs> run through the uh, early 20th century equivalent of photocopying, <coughs> and reused again. So let's us build something, and see how we can apply our principle, our rule of borrowing. First, because this is a scientific method, we'll define the problem. And so we're going to start with a good definition. People keep on changing things on my Jamf server and I don't know what they're doing. I was uh, halfway through a 14-week project to roll out 
Jave Pro in the cloud when I decided to go to New York for two weeks to celebrate my birthday. And I came back, <coughs> and my God, entropy had started to set in. Things had happened, and I didn't know what they were. So I decided that this was the last thing this was going to happen. I needed change tracking for Jamf Pro. So change tracking. That's not exactly going to be an easy problem, but maybe, maybe we'll find out. Uh, next, good engineers read the journals. Or th that's what I thought when I first started out in this game 35 years ago. Of course, nowadays, <coughs> tech journals and magazines have been replaced by blogs. So just as important as borrowing is knowing what to borrow, knowing what's out there, knowing what other people have done. And I read a lot of blogs. And lo and behold, I read something. Rich Troughton had, thank you very much, on his Der Flounder blog, written a bunch of posts about how to back up policy scripts and a bunch of other stuff from my Jamf Pro server. And so I had a good start for where to, where to, where, where to borrow. And even better, thank you very much, Rich. One of the blog posts had a, had a pointer to a whole bunch of code in a Git repo. And lo and behold, I have some shell scripts that start me on the process. Thanks very much, Rich. I stand on your shoulders, and I proudly say it. Um, if you're going to borrow, borrow off the best. So now let's do some work of our own. Well, when I say work, I mean, I don't want to work too hard. <clears throat> um, Rich's code the security wasn't handled terribly well about the Jamf <coughs> Pro username and password, and there has to be a better way of handling that. <coughs> so I did some more searching, and lo and behold, Bryson Tyrrell, who's presented here and is another giant upon whose shoulders I can stand, has written some really nice code about using um, AES-256 to secure your passwords, and to unencrypt them. So I can replace the authentication in Rich's scripts with <coughs> Bryce and Tyrrell's, and I get a major, major improvement. It's looking good. <coughs> and so I can use his code in my own script that's a, basically a copy of Rich's, and that's one more problem fixed. The next thought, as engineers build it step by step, at this point it's tempting to take all of Rich's scripts and build myself a big massive script that first downloads the packages, then downloads the policies, then downloads the scripts, <clears throat> and so on, and so on, and so on, until eventually it gets to the end. But, don't do that. Do it all piece by piece. Keep them in their separate places, because, as Stuart said earlier, we want to test. We want to test, and test, and test. And if we keep it in smaller chunks, it makes it easier to test. It makes it easier to... Uh, <coughs> make sure that the changes we make don't break anything. If we break one of the scripts, it doesn't break all of them, our debugging is a lot easier. Particularly with Bash, I like to keep it in very nice, small, simple chunks. Now, we need to tie it all together. So we write an overall appearance script that will keep all our, uh, that will take our pieces and run them one by one as we want. And that makes it that much easier <coughs> to control the whole process. Rather than having to um, engineer something that will run all five scripts one by one, 
we write an overarching um, architecture that runs each one, one after the other, and that's all we need to worry about, making sure that we get run on a regular basis. So now that we've got that far, how do we track changes? So, okay, first thought, let's spend, I don't know, tracking changes. It's going to take me about a week to figure out how to take the um, a code that is downloaded from the Jamf Pro server, and then I have to compare it with the previous version, and I have to find where the changes are, and that's starting to look like a whole new task. So we've got a new task. <coughs> My metaphor here, we're going to climb a pyramid and see how high we can go. How high can we, can, <coughs> can we <coughs> climb onto a pyramid? And I'm going to start by going to Egypt. And at Giza, I can climb the Great Pyramid of Cheops. And I climb up 138 metres. And at the top, I'm about 180 metres above sea level. Must be able to get higher. So let's go to San Francisco. And I'm going to pack a lunch, take several bottles of water. And I'm going to climb up. Uh, it's 58 floors, or 260 metres of steps. Uh, I timed myself, and I reckon that'll take me around about nine and a half hours. And um, that's including uh, a couple of breaks along the way. Ah, that's a lot of effort. That's a lot of effort. So, I'm going to ask a really, really smart guy how I'm going to get higher. And I go and talk to the Dalai Lama and say, how do I get high? How can I get higher than this with less effort? And he says, well, Tony, Tibet won't be much help. But if you go next door to Nepal, then you can catch a helicopter and go to base camp at Everest. And with just an eight-metre climb. You can climb the Pyramid Laboratory and you will find yourself over 5,000 metres above sea level. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Dalai Lama. What's my lesson here? Start as close to the finish as you can. We want to track changes. Now, there are tools around to track changes. We can use Git. It's not a fantastic, marvelous, powerful tool for, change, for tracking changes inside a Jamf Pro server, but on the other hand, it's very good for tracking changes in text files. And we've converted the database entries into our, in our Jamf Pro server into text files. <coughs> so, don't write something, we'll use git. <coughs> so we add some lines to our parent script. Um, we do a git add star right at the top to make sure that any new files get added to our repo. And then a git commit with a message that gives the date of the commit. Now I know that's stored in the commit record, but it's useful to have it in the message. Then, when we actually want to find changes, we can use git to find the changes. Git log, with the minus pretty equals one line, will <coughs> print out one line for each commit in our repo, and it will show the uh, commit ID, and it will show the commit message, all in one line. That's why it's nice to have the date in the commit message. And then git diff will dump out every single change between the previous version and the current version that is sitting <coughs> in our git repo. That's usually a huge output. So instead, we can use git diff minus name only 
and that will print out just the name of the files that have been changed. <clears throat> so that will tell us uh, if there's a new policy, if a configuration profile has changed, and so on, it will print out the file name <coughs> that's sitting on our computer. And then git diff file will show the changes for just that one file. So as you can see, I've now built a change tracking system for Jamf Pro that is in a way primitive, but it returns the result I want. It's taken very little effort for the end result, and it's built on a bunch of tools that other people have provided to me that have taken some effort, but not a great deal of effort. And they've solved a problem for me. So this <coughs> is how we do some software engineering. Now, I've just run through my <coughs> deck, half my deck in very, very fast time. So, some final thoughts. First one, good engineers comment. Um, I've got on the, uh, that's the left-hand side, yeah, that's still the left-hand side, even though it's behind me. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a script that comes out of my uh, current Jamf Pro instance. And it has a shebang line, as all good bash scripts should, and then it has five lines of comment for the most simple script I've ever seen in my entire life. Literally all it does <coughs> is open whatever has been specified in one of the parameters that's been passed to it. But on the other hand, if I do this for every single script, the more complicated ones, it becomes easier. So even, even uh, this trivial one, I've made sure that I've got a comment because it's good practice. Every time I start a script, in goes the shebang line, in goes the name of the script, in goes a version number, my initials, so who's written it, and the date, and then a short description of what it is meant to do. So that the next time I come across this, I know what I'm doing. Now on the right hand side is in fact uh, the comment block at the top of one of Rich's scripts. As you can see, it describes not just what the script does, but it even gives a hint to you that to make the script work, you have to have an API user that has certain privileges. And he specified that. <coughs> This is the script that downloads, uh, from the top of the script that downloads the scripts from your Jamf Pro instance. So it needs to have read privileges on the scripts in your Jamf Pro instance. So when you create the API account for this script, make sure it has those privileges. And he's put a note there in the script. It's another good practice. If your script needs something, tell people. Back many, many years ago, when I was a professional computer programmer, one of my bosses said to me, Tony, comment like the next person who has to read this code is a psychopath with rage issues who knows your address. <laughs> and... <coughs> The other thing that somebody said to me was, comment so that the next person who has to change this code knows what they're doing, even if that's you six months from now. You may be the only people, person who ever looks at your code, but 
you six months from now may not have exactly the same understanding of exactly what's happening inside their head as you do now. So comment. It's one of the, it's, it's the vital step in software engineering is not just to build it, but to make sure that it can be supported down the line. By the same token, good engineers document. Document everything for the same reason. How a system is set up, how it works, write it all down. You can see here on the screen, on the uh, left, are instructions for how to set up a Mac to run auto package in my current organization. And it gives you all the steps required from a bare Mac to being able to run auto package on that Mac, <coughs> including you know, where to get the recipes, where to get the list of packages, where to get the list of repos to add. That's all included in the document. And on the right-hand side is a confluence page that describes how the ch Jamf change tracking that I've just talked about works, what it does, the components of it. So if you don't have a wiki at your organization, um, we use Confluence. Uh, it has its advantages, it has its drawbacks. Uh, if you're a small organization and you don't want to go paying for one, uh, can I recommend DocuWiki, which um, is really simple, uh, runs on a very simple web server, and uh, uh, supports storing the pages in text files so that they can be edited easily um, both online or separately in a text editor. It's a really, really <coughs> necessary step. Make sure you document. And make sure it's, set it up so it's easy for people to document. So, um, at this point, um, I've totally blown through my whole deck. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. Um, these have been some lessons in software engineering that I've learnt along the way. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. Uh, thank you very much. And there's my personal details. Any questions for Tony? Yes, John. Uh, so Tony, I'm, I'm curious, what does your actual uh, change tracking in Jamf look like? I mean, I saw that you had the, the, the date, but what is the actual information that's going in there? Well, basically what it's doing is it's downloading... Um, for most records in the Jamf Pro instance, it's downloading the XML. Uh, for config profiles, it's downloading the XML and then uh, ripping out the mobile config and saving that. <coughs> and so then when I run a, ch run a, jit a git uh, um, diff file, it shows me um, what uh, elements of the XML have changed and usually that's enough of a clue for me to figure out what's gone wrong. Because uh, uh, I, I don't change track for the, just to track changes. I change track because I have a number of people who are allowed to go into my Jamf Pro instance uh, whom um, I do not trust to behave as responsibly as they should. Uh, so um, I do it so that I can, I can uh, when something breaks, uh, get clues as to what has gone wrong. Whether that's a script change or a policy change or a configuration profile change. Um, uh, if I run a diff and I discover that, you know, the uh, configuration profile hasn't changed whilst the policy has, I know where to look. Um, I can then uh, go into the history of that in the GUI, uh, discover which of the um, uh, responsible engineers has been irresponsible, and um, ask them what they've done um, with a pointed stick. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks so much, Tony, for talking a little bit about the different approaches that you use. Um, 
the if you had to impart to a system administrator one key topic that we haven't talked about yet today that says, okay, you, you need to start thinking about this as a software engineer and not as a systems administrator. Where do you start? What, what would be the next thing you say? Um, what's your pain point? Uh, this, I mean, always, uh, software engineering for systems administrators is always about solving pain points. Um, because software engineering takes some effort, uh, and it takes some effort away from the systems administration that you're probably being told you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So you need to have a reason to do it. And so what is your pain point? Um, my pain point here was I didn't know what people were doing. And um, uh, when things broke, I had to be able to find what had changed quickly. Have you perhaps suggested to our friends at the company in Minneapolis that perhaps they should have some sort of audit tracking log, that kind of thing? Um, well, the, the, uh, they do have, have, a, uh, have a, uh, a history that tells you who's been in. Um, and uh, the sort of change tracking that you want is not a simple engineering effort to get it so it's uh, production and industry ready. Because this isn't, uh, that's another thing is, is with software engineering, is to solve just enough of the problem to get the task done, if you're a system administrator. Um, this is not something that I'd like to ship out as a product. It's just another tool. So I engineer another tool. And that's, that's another important lesson, is, is don't solve too much. Just enough to get the task done. Any more questions? Hey, Tony. Um, it's had me sort of thinking about some different processes, including one maybe to reverse the order and actually do all the change in Git and then upon a commit actually push it to Jam. That's, that's, certainly, um, uh, that's certainly one thing that I am considering. Um, that's good if you want to do massive changes. It's more not necessarily massive changes, but track them, because maybe someone has permissions on Git that they're not allowed to make commits without approval. Sure, yeah, um, uh, uh, that's, that's possible. Um, in my environment, I have a problem in that uh, I run Git local on a server mm. that sits um, outside my um, uh, uh, outside my security <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, walls, or at least halfway out, and uh, it then, because of that, does not have access to an actual um, um, uh, online Git repo. It has to work entirely local. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's uh, that's one reason why I don't do it that way. Um, but yeah, I'm certainly considering doing it the other way. That's and uh, Rich, in his dis uh, posts, discusses that possibility.